Jay Shalonia Zeko Hart is a birth worker, student midwife, and co-founder of the Indigenous Milk Medicine Week, celebrated the second week of National Breastfeeding Month in August. So Nakitaru Tatasati Tata Chikstariku, Stone Go, uh Jay Shalayan Sekoha, Jaha Jakados, um hello again. It's good to visit with you. Um my name is Jay Shalayan Sekoha and I'm an intertribal love song. I'm an enrolled member of the Seminole Nation and um a descendant of the Pawnee Creek Omaha and Iowa tribes. Um I currently reside in Indian Territory, also known as Oklahoma. And I'm a parent of four babies, um, three of which I was able to uh, nurse directly. Um, I'm also two spirit and um, a practicing birth worker, as well as a student midwife. And then a grad student at uh, the University of Oklahoma's College of Law, um, the Master of Legal Studies in Indigenous Peoples Law. Um, so my first exposure, uh, when I think about it, um, you know, I don't have those earliest memories of that time with my mother, um, but I was a breastfed baby um, briefly. My mother was a working mother. Um, she uh, also did not have a supportive system um, in that of a partner, in that of um, community. Um, I felt like from my perspective, it seemed like my mother was isolated in her experience. So she, you know, almost as soon as she had me, she almost had to go back to work. So that time that we had was very brief, um, but I do remember asking her about it and her sharing with me because um, she also had my brother and sister a short time after me and they're twins. And so she was trying her best also to nurse them as well. Um, and so I really look up to the lived experiences of my mother as well as kind of how my mother raised us and how she treated us, you know, um, what, what was it, why was it? Um, and I reflect on that when I think about my experiences um, as a human in this world, and especially as a Native person, a Native matriarch, um, and a lot of times it follows along similar lines because of the disruption in our, in our traditional kinship, our, our practices, and um, I think when uh, another time of exposure for me, I think before I started um, nursing my own, uh, was my oldest sister. She uh, was 10 years older than me, and she had two babies um, that I remember uh, like uh, like I was a child when she had them. So, um, and then the, the last one she had when I was a mother of my own at that point. Um, but those babies, uh, she was able to nurse. Um, occasionally, I got to see that. Um, we didn't really talk about it. Um, and I, I wouldn't say that that was exactly normalized, but I just loved her so much and just adored everything she did. So in that kind of little sibling, little sister way, um, I almost mirrored, you know, what, what she would do um, with her, even her career. Um, we were both in early childhood education at one point, and then um, I really appreciated how she just loved me and loved her family, um, loved my, my Tiwats, my nieces, my niece and nephews. And so I feel like when I became a parent unexpectedly, um, I was in such a, such a unprepared place. Um, I did not have resources uh, abundant to me in the ways that are culturally relevant or culturally appropriate, culturally humble. Um, a lot of it was, yeah, clinical kind of uh, resource. Um, a lot of it felt very, oh, how to say this in a diplomatic way. <laughs> it felt like it, I was trying to be saved because like I was this unmarried, um, low income brown person, you know, I was checking off these boxes for these organizations that, you know, are there to, to help and support. And yet I felt very shamed for my lifestyle choices and just being in a position of unpreparedness as this first time parent. And then um, in going through the, you know, the pregnancy, labor and delivery through the Indian health system, there was a lot of disempowering experiences there. And in particular it was my, my plan um, for when my baby came into this world, um, I immediately wanted skin to skin. I had researched about um, breastfeeding um, myself, not uh, not any um, 
nurse or uh, clinician in those fields of resources that had reached out to me and asked me if this is what you're going to do more often they were like oh here's WIC uh, fill out this form here's food stamps fill out this form um, we have this parenting program if you come to our courses you know we need you to fill out these questionnaires um, they didn't tell me you know I was a plot point in their data but they were like you can get a car seat uh, you can get a crib um, so some of my research just came from my need to know more information about what I could do to be a best provider for this infant or this being that was to come that I was so scared to, to have and be responsible for. Um, so in the hospital, I knew I wanted to have skin to skin. I knew I wanted to have um, this baby on my breast as soon as possible, you know, within that first hour. And that was taken from me due to the coercive decisions of the medical providers that I had thought I you know, could trust. Um, they, I felt like I was really kind of coerced into the epidural that I didn't need. So when my baby came out, I felt like she was drugged, even though um, I knew when I saw her, she was okay. She wasn't crying. So they wanted to take her and, you know, make her cry. And as a birth worker and a student midwife, I totally understand what that means now, but the conversations that they could have had about it were not happening. Um, they let me, ha let me have um, her on my chest for like, oh gosh, brief, of course, I'm, you know, in this vulnerable state of just giving birth, but it did not, it was not the 30 minutes to an hour that I had wanted. Um, they quickly took her away. And then when they took her for observation, once they got her to, to breathe, to cry, she was breathing, but to cry, um, they took her away for what seemed like hours. Um, I think it was an hour, hour and a half max. Um, I kept asking where my baby was. And my partner at the time um, did not go with them. <laughs> so we did not have that. Uh, and I didn't have a birth worker there to like help me navigate any of that, um, to help you know explain or get the explanations that needed to happen with me. Um, my consent uh, in, in, in the truest form, you know, not because I was incapacitated. Um, and so like family members got to see my baby longer than I got to see them. Cause at the time it was, you know, they could go and see the babies in the little nursery as they called it then. Um, and when my baby came back, that baby had formula, um, a little, little, you know, thing of formula. And I was so upset. I was so upset because I did not want my baby to start off that way. And they couldn't tell me how much they had given my baby. Um, and I think that really kind of sealed into my partner's mind that like this is the way this is how babies eat and I was like no they don't they don't have to I don't I didn't want my baby to so we had a very short and difficult journey um in that in that first uh, real I guess lived um uh, exposure <laughs> um with my first child so um but I took all that uh, as an opportunity to uh to to heal um in the subsequent work that I've done, um, both within my family and then outside, you know, um, through Indigenous Smoke Medicine Week, as it's called now. Um, so I appreciate you asking that question. Okay, so there were a lot of barriers <laughs> enumerated, multiple barriers there uh, that you encountered uh, with that came along with your first exposure. Sounds like or your 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 lived experience. Um, you were the founder of what was Native um, Breastfeeding Week and is now Indigenous, uh, is it Milk Medicine Week? I see it, yeah. So this uh, founding, it has been tremendous in helping not just, I mean, I, I can see how the effect on everyone's um, consciousness that this is having to, to put that phrase out there, milk medicine, is so wonderful and rich. It's so it's uh, I think it's fantastic that we have the language um, for everyone. But for you, this was a barrier jumper to form this for yourself uh, and for Native Americans, for Indigenous peoples. How did you go about that? How did you? What prompted that organization? I'm gonna get organized and and create this. Um, I think I. 
my heart within my my soul my chiksu as we say um i'm just a good troublemaker <laughs> i ask a lot of questions um because i uh i'm an active participant in my world in my community and so when i do see something that um seems to be like a barrier or a challenge um i kind of want to know like what's the reason you know why why is it happening this way is is there another way it could be done um, and I can't get my mind to stop that. So, um, so as a, a parent who my the second time I became a parent, um, I was uh, able to have a successful um, indigenous or milk medicine journey with my child. Um, I was able to to heal a lot um, from that experience. Uh, my current spouse and I, um, we were both with other people before we got together. So we already had a blended family. And when we decided to have children together, um, I told him right away, I'm having a home birth. And it just blew his mind because even though we're both native, we're both very grounded in our, our culture, um, that part of our culture was not practiced abundantly. And it's still not. Um, those lessons, those, those songs, those words are still kind of yet to be found or yet to be called back. Um, I don't believe that they're lost forever. I just believe that they're just underground or, you know, where they need to be right now until, until we're able to bring them back. Um, and so I was able to really navigate um, what home birth looked like for us as, um, as these native people that were, you know, reclaiming this space, um, reclaiming the ceremony. And, um, the research that again I had the I I did put into it to ensure that a provider um, could meet our needs because uh, initially those providers that I had sought uh, were not there like um, anything anybody that was um, of my tribal community anybody that was native but not of my specific heritage um, and then if they are, they were there they were states away, as we know, <laughs> know these places to be called, you know, several hundreds uh, or even thousands of miles away from where I live in Indian Territory. And I do live in a very rural community where we are very um, underserved, if not historically excluded, um, in resources uh, related to healthcare uh, equity. So, um, you know, again, I, I researched uh, about that relationship uh, with uh, nursing my child, with providing that indigenous milk medicine to my baby. Um, you know, I looked again into uh, the mechanics more um, than I could have done the first time. I didn't even know what to look for the first time. I just, you know, just thought baby to breast. And we, you know, many of us in this lactation space know that's, you know, definitely um, reduction, you know, reductive of what happens. Um, but uh, my baby was, uh, a, we had good latch, like we had, we had worked at it, you know, um, I did not have too much major complications. In fact, I think I just had a lot, a lot, mil a lot of milk that I um, have, I think I always overproduce, um, even the first time I didn't know it. And so because I wasn't ex ex uh, getting rid of it, um, all the first time I had developed mastitis and that really effectively ended my um my relationship with uh, nursing my first child, um, not knowing that you can work through that then. Um, but yeah, with, with this baby, um, you know, I was a working parent in the in this sense of like office work, like I had to report to an employer, um, eight to five, Monday through Friday, um, an office job that uh, afforded me those breaks. Um, it was with uh, a tribal nation. Um, and so I thought there'd be a lot more understanding to, uh, to you know, m to this journey as a new parent, especially because I worked in the um, health education uh, division of our tribe, or of that tribe. And um, so I had asked for like uh, time to adjust coming back from uh, what they call maternity leave or this perinatal, you know, period of post or postpartum. And um, I wanted to kind of figure out a schedule of like, like pumping um, because I still, you know, wanted to provide that milk to my baby. And uh, my baby was about to go into childcare. 
So I didn't know what all that would look like. And I wanted to work out what I, what I thought would be any potential kinks before I came back on like full-time 40 hours. And at, initially my, my supervisor was down and then she came back maybe like two weeks before I was due back to tell me, no, that can't work. The director, which is over her, was unwilling to provide a flexible schedule for me and my baby. And I was really upset, like hurt and crushed. Like I could not understand, especially as a, a tribal nation, what the, like, what, what the challenge was for them and me, um, like having to be there in, you know, in this way, I, I even negotiated, you know, tried to negotiate at least like two to one week, like transition period, and they were unwilling. So I kind of already knew going into it that they were not going to be understanding. Um, I tried to make my way with uh, like, instead of always pumping during my breaks, the childcare was not too far from my office. I uh, would just go down there on my breaks and just nurse my baby directly. Um, and I know not a lot of people have that uh, privilege. Um, I also had a, a, a much better support network and especially with my partner, sometimes if he had our baby, cause our baby didn't go out every day of the week, um, he would bring the baby by and we would visit and then we get to nurse my baby instead of just always pumping. But then at some point um, work got a little busier. So I had to just pump um, and not be able to see my baby as much. Um, it was during those um, breaks as, as they called them um, <laughs> where I was uh, like the butt of some jokes by some male coworkers. Um, like they were talking about me and what I was doing and my milk and it was a uh, discrimination it was harassment I reported it and um, was like the bane of everybody's existence in that department because it was it's a smaller community so everybody knows everybody or they're related to somebody um, and so how dare I not understand that this person's joking how dare I lever it or levy or you know wage this unfair <laughs> battle, um, like I have no right, uh, how dare I? And that was really uh, like a surprise for me um, that like I was being penalized or ostracized um, for something that somebody else did that was wrong. And so in that process of going through uh, HR policies, um, and related uh, effects of um, like what my rights are as a, uh, at the time I called myself a breastfeeding mother. Um, you know, I found a lot more information um, just nationally as, as well as um, from other tribal nations, like some of this work that they're doing and um, related to policies for providing um, like, you know, safe spaces, um, access to uh, lactation for parents who are nursing their kids or need to pump on the job. Um, it was in all that research that I also was noticing there wasn't very much though um, regarding like this, you know, information I want to present on my behalf <laughs> and advocating for myself further in that workspace um, that I couldn't pull too much from tribal nations. I couldn't pull too much from at the national level either of like what it is for us as Native people um, in that lactation space. Um, and the visibility was was very, very few and far between, and it's especially limited to people who were, I guess, my shade or lighter on the Native spectrum, um, and who very much look like uh, women or people with, um, you know, what we would identify as breasts, you know, like the imagery was just not inclusive, um, as well as not abundant. Um, and so then I started working with uh, or trying to work with uh, my state's um, breastfeeding coalition uh, on like what they were doing for Native people, like what they have done, what they could have done, because I knew they did policy um, and they still haven't tried to, to, to really bridge that, um, I guess, inner tribal interaction um, with what the work that they're doing, you know, no um, comment there necessarily, but just um, yeah, even then it, they didn't have it. Um, and so when I was seeing raising awareness of, of um, different groups who have been um, disrupted in their uh, milk medicine journeys, you know, such as uh, African-Americans or black Americans, you know, um, us as native Americans or indigenous peoples, 
even um, uh, like the Latin X or um, Hispanic community. Um, they, it just was like with the data, uh, with the data they were taking and with the groups that are like, um, have the highest disparities, like what more could be done? Oh, Black Breastfeeding Week has a week researching them and the founders and what they had been doing and wondering why like where where is our week as native people as indigenous people um hitting up my state's coalition and asking them about running this week um here in oklahoma specifically because we have 39 tribal uh, jurisdictions with a lot more native people than that here that reside in the state and kind of getting nowhere getting dead ends um, reached out to a nonprofit organization that I had, had inter interviewed with before about um, nursing or breastfeeding. And uh, we attempted to launch it together and they kind of just ghosted me. <laughs> and so I was kind of left with this, these work, these ideas, tried to you know, talk to the, to the entities that I thought I needed to and just took it on my own and reached out to friends, reached out to these folks that I actually work with now um, through Indigenous Monk Medicine Collective, which sponsors the week. Um, like initially it just started as like a social media campaign, right? Like just awareness. Um, this is what we look like. This is who we are. This is the data that's out there. These are the barriers that out that's out there. Also, these are the reasons why there are these barriers. And it just, connected I guess like um you know just a just a fight for uh I guess for justice <laughs> a fight for um visibility turned like um in my own space in my own life turned into like this um vibration amongst other folks who had been in the same circumstances and we some of us were able to band together to really amplify like what we have been going through, but also the joy and the beauty of our, um, I guess, resilience and of our culture. Um, and so that's uh, essentially how, uh, as it was called then, Native Breastfeeding Week came to be. Um, and then in its third year, we have uh, renamed ourselves Indigenous Milk Medicine Week um, because we recognize that uh, not only is Native breastfeeding um, that terminology very gendered, it, it also doesn't exactly convey everything that we're doing here, right? Like we're not just talking about um, the nuts and bolts or the mechanics of, you know, humans nursing their children or feeding their children. We're talking about these political, you know, disruptions, these cultural disruptions, um, social disruptions that um, were very systematic intentionally systematic. Um, and I think that's the consciousness that you're talking about. It's like our work is um, in collaboration with these other, you know, native um, folks, these other um, black folks, like all these people who have been on the ground in our various communities, you know, trying to create, um, I guess, a quality of life that our people so deserve. And we have just, you know, in our own ways, um, continue to, to, to raise up the, um, to, to continue to try to raise up the consciousness of our people. I feel like for me, the more of my people, my native people that can live in the dreamscape, the better we are. So I talked to Cecilia Tamori, who's from John Hopkins University for this series, and she uses the word colonization when she talks about the formula company's impact on uh, our cultural biases against breastfeeding over the last 150 years. And she says it was an intentional colonization, not just of America, of course, but other countries. And I have seen you in your interviews, including the one with Kindred, use the word uh, that this is a decolonization process that you're going through. Can, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, for sure. So again, like at the time of the founding of Native Breastfeeding Week, you know, we just had the language that we had, right? We had the perspective that we had because I feel like in time we are essentially actually healing, unlearning, decolonizing. We have been so conditioned um, to think in binaries, to think in dichotomies, to other, even our own medicine. Um, many of us, not all of us, but many of us. 
um, are, are displaced in um, various stages. And so with um, Indigenous Milk Medicine Week, we are essentially reclaiming our place as healers for, um, you know, for our babies by being able to provide this milk medicine to our Indigi, you know, babies. Um, and I think when we are able to kind of name, you know, what it is we're doing in such a way, it really lends itself to to other folks to recognize, you know, um, kind of the, I guess the lens that I was talking about, that indigenous lens, right? Like we, many of our communities have, have or have had um, stories about uh, our milk with our babies. Um, it was taught to me that uh, one of the words for milk, um, and I can't remember the language, I think it was um, up in like the Great Lakes area, is corn. Um, and I know that in, in another community that um, I descend from, they were saying that we bless our memories, if you will, with corn. Um, so for some of us, you know, that, that basically that um, those teachings are there and, um, and, they're, and they're not practiced in abundance. And so we have to, again, um, reflect on that as we're working on healing for the future. And we know um, even into, you know, today's research and, and the qualitative studies of uh, breast or chest milk, human milk, um, you can um, have a part in your grandchildren's future. You know, that nutrition um, does, you know, go forward. Um, that's not just like, you know, some mystical native person telling you these things. It's real legitimate. We just have oral knowledge that tells us this and people need that like uh, qualitative, uh, you know, science, um, as you call it, uh, <laughs> research in the labs to help prove or in the surveys to help prove your point or prove this point. But um, yeah, so so this whole like um, transformation, I would say, is part of decolonization, um, is part of reconnecting to who we are as Native people and our abilities and our truths in order to help heal our communities. It's a collective community wellness. It's like taking control of public health through this one act, right? Like there's many acts we can do, but we even know just this one, you know, one act has so many benefits physically, culturally, emotionally, spiritually. So it's, um, yeah, that's the best way I think I could describe what that means um, in, in the act of decolonization or decolonizing breast and chest feeding. Thank you so, so much uh, for talking to me today. Is there anything else that you would like for the conference attendees to know? Yeah, uh, actually I, I do. Um, I was just pulling up some notes I had from just, just other conversations I've had with um, myself and others um, that indigenous milk medicine is, you know, a, is a first sacred food and it's sustainable food system that we must do everything to protect and promote lactation providers, breast, chest, body feeders, with access um, and as much social, political, and environmental support. So that's taken from, you know, uh, I think it's either the CDC uh, or the World um, Breastfeeding um, Week's um, work. But, uh, you know, if you're able to acknowledge the source um, of health disparities, um, such as what's happened in Native and Indigenous communities, you know, you can support in the healing and cultural resilience of our communities by investing in our initiatives, supporting our work. Um, you know, it goes beyond uh, just, you know, a post and <laughs> saying you support us. We need you to actually, you know, um, invest in our nation building, um, equipping um, our native families and communities with um, being able to create these conditions to support our native um, families, um, our futures, um, because we are also inner, you know, interwoven here. We're not just like 
one group um, needs more support than the other and it's taking from your community. No, when we create that balance, we create equity, right? And I think that's what we all want is that overall wellness um, and an equitable, equitable future. So yeah, that's all I would have to add. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to keeping up with everything that you're doing there, Jaisha. Thank you so much for all of your work.